afternoon. I'm Rachel Callanan, the Clerk Assistant Procedure with the Department of the Senate. Welcome to the fifth lecture in our 2021 Senate Lecture Series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respect to their elders, past and present. Today is International Day of People with Disability. To mark this occasion, Australia's Disability Discrimination Commissioner, Dr Ben Gauntlet, will present today's lecture, titled Disability Policy in Australia, Where To Next? Dr Gauntlet will be followed by Senator Jordan Steele-John, who will reflect on the significance of this day to him as a parliamentarian. Due to logistics, including the ongoing impact of the pandemic, both Dr Gauntlet and Senator Steele-John will be making their contributions today via recorded video. Both contributions have been open captioned and I'm joined here in Canberra today by Auslan interpreters who will interpret the event. Dr Ben Gauntlet was appointed as a Disability Discrimination Commissioner with the Australian Human Rights Commission in 2019. One of his many goals as Commissioner is strengthening legal and policy frameworks to protect disability rights. A Rhodes Scholar with distinguished career in law, Dr Gauntlet worked as an associate to the Honourable Justice Kenneth Hayne AC at the High Court of Australia and as counsel assisting to the Solicitor General of the Commonwealth. He has also taught law at universities in Australia and the United Kingdom. Dr Gauntlet has played an important role in contributing to the development of disability policy in Australia. He sits on a number of government advisory committees and has led the Commission's engagement with the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disabilities. Dr Gauntlet has also appeared before several Senate committee inquiries and recently he provided evidence at Senate estimates about his own lived experience of a national disability insurance scheme. We will now hear from Dr Gauntlet. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, my name is Ben Gauntlet, so I'm the Disability Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission. And it's an absolute honour and a privilege today on International Day of Persons with Disabilities to give you a lecture on disability policy in Australia, where to next. I've always very much admired the work of the Australian Senate in ensuring that disability policy in Australia is rigorously considered. And to be asked to give a lecture on this day, which is also the day when the decade long Australian disability strategy is being released is something that I very much appreciate. I'd like to begin my remarks by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which I'm presenting to you today. In particular, I acknowledge my deep respect to the traditional owners of the land in Sydney, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to the land. I also acknowledge any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders or community members who are here today and acknowledge their presence. The Australian Parliament is located in Canberra, which is Ngunnawal country, and I acknowledge their traditional ownership of the traditional ownership of that land too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in 1996, the following remarks were made by the then president of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, Sir Ronald Wilson. The choices presented in the current debate about what sort of society we wish to be are immensely important for all people with disability. Are we an inclusive society that values the participation of all its members? Are we committed to justice and redress of injustice and disadvantage? Are we committed to human dignity and equal respect for all members of our society? Clearly, while the bell tolls for all of us, they toll for people with disability as much, if not more than most. This was a speech given at the Kenneth Jenkins oration in 1996. I gave the same speech 
at that event in 2019 and asked whether the quote was still relevant in Australia. It could not have been foreseen at that time that the COVID-19 pandemic would strike. It is though true to say that the words of Sir Ronald Wilson ring true today as they have at other times. But today I want to answer perhaps a more simple question, which is where to next for disability policy in Australia? I firmly believe that good disability policy benefits all Australians. But maybe the issue for Sir Ronald in 1996 and me 25 years later is does every Australian realise this? And more importantly, what are the implications for disability policy in the next decade for some people not realising the need for good disability policy? In relation to my remarks today, what I intend to do is to work through some PowerPoint slides which will be made available to anyone who wishes to access them. What I will then do is share my screen if that's okay. And as I stated there, my presentation to you is entitled Disability Policy in Australia, Where To Next? To consider the issue of where to next for disability policy in Australia, I'm first going to deal with the issue of what is meant by disability in Australia and the number of people and the prevalence of disability that exists. I'm then going to talk about International Day of People with Disability and why, why it's important, but also why it's important that the meaning that's given to the day this year is given effect to throughout the society in which we live. It would be remiss of me not to consider the effect of COVID-19. And I am also going to then go on to consider the Australian Disability Strategy as it has been released today and talk about some of the consultation took place in relation to that strategy but also the critical issues for Australia that exist now and in the future concerning the implementation of disability policy. And finally, I'm going to hopefully answer the question of where to next. So I want to make four key points, which I hope you'll take away from this presentation today. The first of those points is beguiling in its simplicity. And that is that every time a government enacts a policy, whether it be for housing, whether it be for employment, whether it be for the health system, one of the issues it needs to consider is how people with disability are recognised and considered in that policy. The intergovernmental agreement relating to housing in 2018 does not mention disability once. We need to ensure that we have a cross-cutting approach to all aspects of social and economic policy where disability is considered. The second point I wish to make is that community awareness of disability is important. But the very nature of what people are being made aware of is equally important. And in particular, what people need to be made aware of is the human rights of people with disability now and in the future. The third point I want to make today is that when you consider disability policy, it is ultimately about individuals. Individuals like me. I had a spinal cord injury when I was 16 playing rugby union. It was a Monday night. I walked onto the rugby field thinking that I would go home later that night and consider what I was doing the next day because a far more important match was on the next day. It took me six months to get home. But when we consider disability policy, I was an individual. The people I was in hospital with had radically different outcomes from their circumstances, not because of 
some want of motivation on their behalf, but because of their ability to access services or the socioeconomic services, socioeconomic situation where they came from. We need to appreciate when we design disability policy that it is ultimately about individuals and that people with disability are diverse and that disability is diverse too. And finally, the point I wish to make is that for the Australian disability strategy to be successful, we need a whole of community engagement. So one of the, the critical issues in disability policy is to ensure that people understand how many people live with disability in Australia. 4.4 million Australians live with disability. That is somewhere between one sixth and one fifth of the population. There is also the issue that disability or the onset of disability is directly related to age. And so in relation to that issue, what we know is that 7.6% of children aged between zero to 14 live with some form of disability. And that changes with age to approximately 50% of people with disability over the age of 65. And in that respect, it is important to acknowledge that disability does not have an age cutoff. The age cutoff that has been imposed in Australia and across the world is arbitrarily related to means of social security or legislation relating to certain entitlements. It is not relating to the human rights conception of what is disability. And there are some other important statistics which it is important that people are aware of. One fifth of households have a person with disability in it. And in fact, if you consider people under the age of 65, approximately 99% of people with disability live in the community, but only 5% of the housing stock is accessible. And if you consider the education attainment of people with disability, only one third of people with disability have finished year 12, but two thirds of people without disability have finished year 12. So it is important to acknowledge that there is a breadth of disability that people can overlook. And one of the reasons why people can overlook disability is that over 80% of disability is invisible, but also disability can be episodic in nature. And it is important to realize that in relation to disability, there is no uniform definition as to what it is across Australia. And the definition that has been used to come up with the figure of 4.4 million people looks at functional impairments across a series of life domains. This differs from the definition that exists across, for example, the Disability Discrimination Act or state equivalent acts. So I remarked before that one of the critical aspects of today is that it was International Day of People with Disability and it coordinated nicely with the launch of the Australian Disability Strategy for the next decade. The theme of International Day of People with Disability is a long one. The theme is leadership and participation of persons with disabilities toward an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post-COVID-19 world. The Australian Disability Strategy was obviously drafted before the theme for today was developed. But in a sense, there is a common strain across both policies that needs to be considered. Both policies very much focus upon the participation and inclusion of people with disability, with there being a need for community involvement. Now, sometimes when people discuss disability and diversity, they do not view disability as the equal of other diversity characteristics. This is in error and it is hopefully something that the largest organisations across Australia and the world are reconsidering in terms of how they undertake diversity and inclusion. 
But one of the aspects of the theme for International Day of People with Disability that is critical to consider is the sustainable development goals and disability. Too often when people consider the sustainable development goals in papers relating to some of our largest companies or reports relating to compliance with sustainable development goals, they forget that five of the sustainable development goals specifically refer to disability. And in particular, sustainable development goal eight particularly refers to the employment of people with disability. Another issue that needs to be remembered when we consider the theme of International Day of People with Disability this year is that what is accessible is not just about the built environment. It is also about the electronic environment and how we communicate with one another. So the theme of International Day of People with Disability has been released and it is obviously related to COVID-19. We've also had the Australian Disability Strategy released today. And what I want to therefore do is to perhaps acknowledge what has been a significant issue for everyone in Australia, but particularly for people with disability. And that is the policy response relating to COVID-19 and what that has caused in relation to the response of the disability community. A number of areas have arisen which are concerning, and I'm hopeful that all levels of government will reflect upon how they can be, how those policies can be implemented better in the future when we're considering such things as booster shots. They include the access to healthcare, the availability of disability support workers, vaccine access, which includes the booking of vaccines and for vaccines to, to be provided in an accessible and well-considered manner, reflective of people's underlying medical conditions, and the need to, to support a decision-making to consent to the provision of vaccines. And the key issues which have fallen out of that policy response is a need to consult with people with disability, to understand reasonable adjustment of policy to ensure people with disability have been appropriately considered in terms of the policy response, but also that there is community awareness of people with disability, and that is broader than just people with a physical disability, like spinal cord injury, but considers invisible and communication disability. So with COVID-19 still a very important issue for the country, and with International People with Disability Day, upon us, the Australian Disability Strategy has today been released by all levels of Australian government and supported by the highest levels of government. The Australian Human Rights Commission has been heavily consulted in relation to the Australian Disability Strategy and it has tried to ensure that all aspects of a person's, person with disabilities life are considered. The Australian Disability Strategy is different from the previous National Disability Strategy in that it now has an emphasis on both community attitudes, but also implementation. However, I wanna pause just for a moment to reflect upon the consultation that has been undertaken concerning the National Disability Strategy. No consultation is ever perfect. But I think it is important to acknowledge the effort that the Department of Social Services has gone to, to try and ensure that people with disability views have been considered. You'll see there on the picture that there is a balance between the stage one consultations, which were more generic in nature, and the stage two consultations, which were more specialised in nature. And the only thing I would acknowledge in relation to those consultations was that the workshops and the specific consultations that had to take place had to be undertaken within the spectre of COVID-19 and physical distancing requirements, which made it challenging for all involved. 
what has resulted in the Australian disability strategy is a new emphasis on measurement and accountability of implementation in policy areas. And whilst the previous national disability strategy was rightly considered to be a revolutionary document when it was drafted, one of the challenges that soon became apparent was the outcomes framework or the lack of outcomes framework that was associated with, this, with the strategy. You'll see from the slide that I have on the screen there, that the measurement and accountability, the policy and the delivering of action under the strategy have all been clearly enunciated to try and ensure there is greater involvement of people with disability, but also it is measured as to what is occurring in relation to people with disability. And one of the importance of data, or the importance of data when collected consistently with human rights considerations, is that it can make invisible need visible. Associated with the strategy is the Strategies Advisory Council, of which Minister Rustin has been kind enough to appoint me to. And this strategy and the advisory council is different from the previous strategy in that there is a role for people with disability in the final policy discussion. And there is also a greater focus on implementation through the use of targeted action plans, associated plans and outcomes framework, progress and implementation reports and specific strategy products. It is hoped that the Strategies Advisory Council would seek to ensure that good disability policy is developed, which is reflective of the needs of the disability community. And there are two areas that I really want to then focus upon, which I think good disability policy or there needs to be good feet, good engagement from not only the disability community, but the community more broadly. The first of these is in the area of employment. The employment limb of the national, of the Australian disability strategy rather, has a number of policy outcomes which it's seeking to achieve. They are particularly laudable. We know that when people with disability are not just getting a job, but a good job, they are healthier, safer, and the economy in which they're operating in is more likely to be able to to allocate resources to people who need it. In a sense, one of the justifications for the National Disability Insurance Scheme was that it would radically change the employment outcomes for people with disability. And perhaps quite rightly, the Australian Disability Strategy has realised that the employment outcomes for people with disability in Australia are not what they should have been. And because they are not what they should have been, it has meant that we still have a participation gap of 30 percentage points between people with disability accessing employment and people without a disability accessing employment. The other Australian disability strategy outcome area that is incredibly important is the area of community attitudes. We know when we look at public health campaigns that there actually is a considerable amount of science that goes into trying to change hearts and minds on a particular issue. Examples include smoking, the use of seat belts, and bike helmets relating to the safety of individuals. There's also campaigns relating to mental health that have occurred in Australia and overseas. But what's not often appreciated is that it's not just what, sorry, it's not just that you have a campaign, it's what's in the campaign that is critically important. How long it goes for is also important and what levels of government or society that are considered 
also matter. And for any campaign to be successful, it is of vital importance that it considers not just the structural levels of the economy or overall impact, but how it impacts upon organisations and finally how it impacts upon individuals. And for the community attitudes aspect of the Australian disability strategy to be effective, it's important that this, the campaign is one that goes for a considerable time period that is multi-channeled and that seeks to ensure that it educates people as to the rights of people with disability now and in the future. I might then just stop briefly and reflect upon the history of the National Disability Strategy so that I can then sum up with, in a sense, where to next for disability policy in Australia. The first National Disability Strategy was implemented in 2011 following the completion of the shutout report. And it was widely lauded by the disability community in part because it perhaps was the precursor to the implementation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. But what has been seen since is whilst this focus on the National Disability Insurance Scheme is important and that 10 to 15% of Australians living with disability benefit from the National Disability Insurance Scheme, there has been inconsistent application of the National Disability Strategy in other areas. In, for example, accessible housing, accessible transport, accessible information technology, in law reform relating to such areas as forced sterilisation, support and decision making, people being deemed unfit to plead and also people being subject to involuntary hospital admission and involuntary medical procedures. All these areas are areas of considerable concern for Australia in terms of its implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And these issues are issues that need to be picked up at a state and Commonwealth level and be reformed to ensure that people with disability are treated with dignity and respect. And so whilst it is no small task, in fact, it's a Herculean task that some of the law reform must take place when considering areas such as the Disability Discrimination Act, it needs to be clearly stated that in some areas relating to people with disability, such as discrimination laws, we need to strongly and repeatedly consider whether the legal system we have is fit for purpose. And what we want to get to in terms of a policy construct is a policy construct where universal design is valued. That is, to the fullest extent possible, people with disability can use the services or products that would be used by any other member of the community. Now, I mentioned this, the NDIS, and the NDIS is something that should be rightly applauded for being an iconic social policy in Australia. But it also needs to be understood that it exists in a broader policy framework. And the debate concerning the NDIS has undoubtedly been influenced by the work of the Australian Senate, which is to be applauded. But in terms of the work of the Australian Senate and disability advocacy groups more generally, one of the things that needs to be established is what is the responsibility of state and Commonwealth government concerning the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The needs that should be looked after in the Australian Disability Strategy should be based on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But what we know from the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities reviews by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is the principal review mechanism under the Convention in 2013 and 2019, is that the implementation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme was 
struggling in areas to do with quality and non-discrimination, in part because the failure of a broader policy construct. And when we talk about things such as ILC or we talk about things such as Tier 2 in Australia in the next decade, what we also have to talk about is the Australian Disability Strategy. And the way how, how I would ask people to consider the importance of the Australian Disability Strategy is that if the National Disability Insurance Scheme is the house, the Australian Disability Strategy is the foundations for the house, it's the lawn around the house, and it's the fencing. And the Australian Disability Strategy should be based upon the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. It therefore should acknowledge a concept of inclusive equality. That is, that we acknowledge the socioeconomic circumstances, the issues of stigma, the issues to understand the need for participation and the issues relating to diversity of individuals in developing policies to ensure that people have an equality of opportunity moving forward. And those critical issues in Australia are in a sense in front of us in a way that is both stark and can be confronting because of COVID-19. But we need to focus through the Australian Disability Strategy on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and its implementation. The emphasis that should exist is to ensure that individuals with disability are treated with dignity and respect and are able to the fullest extent possible to partake in economic and social participation, i.e. we should be very concerned about the segregation of people with disability moving forward. We need a whole of community engagement to ensure that people with disability are included now and in the future. And that whole of community engagement must reach to the highest levels of government and the highest levels of businesses and other not-for-profit organisations. Greater use of, of pre-existing consultation mechanisms will hopefully ensure that disability policy is able to be responsive and consider the needs of people with disability. An example of a pre-existing consultation mechanism is hopefully the advisory council attached to the Australian Disability Strategy. But in terms of considering what is provided to in consultations, is that what we need is that data is made freely available as to whether policy is or is not working. And also within that data, that we're very careful to ensure that we make invisible need visible and that the data is able to be used by people with disability and that research is also able to be undertaken by people with disability rather than just for people with disability. It's obvious within this broader policy construct that there's a lot to do. And some of what will need to take place is that there is law reform on issues such as supportive decision-making and forced sterilisation which will require significant effort to, to ensure that appropriate policy responses are created. But some of the other issues, such as community engagement and the willingness of organisations to employ people with disability, are able to be activated or considered now. It is important that when we look at disability in Australia, we don't think that the outcomes, the opportunities, the efforts that have been undertaken have been all in vain. One only has to look at the Paralympics and the We the 15 campaign to admire the way in which people with disability can be embraced by the Australian community. However, it is important that we embrace people of all backgrounds and all life circumstances when we consider disability inclusion. The Royal Commissions for both Aged Care Quality and Safety and Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability 
have a key role in ensuring that people with disability who may not otherwise be able to advocate for themselves can be heard. They can change mindsets by ensuring that accountability takes place for what has occurred in the past and could occur in the future. One of the areas where the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation has provided considerable feedback that has assisted the disability community is ensuring that the COVID-19 response was fit for purpose and, consi and considered people with disability as the holders of rights. This is undeniably important. But within the COVID-19 lifestyle changes that have existed and the technology that has now been relied upon, it is important that we also embrace the opportunity to use technology, that we realise that people can work from home, that medical consultations can occur online, that it is possible to use technology to assess whether a person has or has not had a vaccine to ensure that we keep people safe. But within the technology that exists and the changing lifestyle based upon COVID-19, it is undeniably important that the advocacy and inclusion of people with disability is always respected. Nothing about us without us must have some weight given to it. The advisory council that is attached to the Australian Disability Strategy is an example of advocacy and inclusion of people with disability in decision making, but it cannot be the only example. And we need state equivalents of these policies. To ensure people with disability are included, we need leaders in the community, both with and without a disability, to encourage the capacity building of people with disability going forward. And we need to embrace at the moment what are some unique economic conditions that can hopefully be taken advantage of. One of the great privileges I have as Disability Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission is to decide upon projects. And one of the areas that I identified when I was appointed was the importance of the employment of people with disability because when people with disability are getting not just a job but a good job, what is occurring is that the disability policy system is working well. And we have ranked 21st out of 29 in the OECD and had a participation rate that has not moved for 20 years for too long. So we developed the includability project, which requires organisations at their highest levels, that being a CEO or equivalent, to commit to the employment of people with disability over a three-year period. The organisations that have joined include the ABC, ANZ, Australia Post, the Australian Public Service, the Boston Consulting Group, the City of Sydney, Commonwealth Bank, Herbert Smith Freehills, Kmart, Medibank, Microsoft, the New South Wales Public Service, PricewaterhouseCoopers, the University of Queensland, Rio Tinto, Westpac, and the Woolworths Group. And the importance of those organisations joining up to this project is that hopefully they will be an example to others about the importance of disability issues in the boardroom. When we get to the issue of where to next, we can often hypothesize five or 10 years into the future. That is in a sense, easy to do. But instead, I wanna focus on the now. I articulated four critical issues for disability policy in Australia going forward. But one issue is an issue that can be dealt with tomorrow. And that is the employment of people with disability. With unemployment figures in Australia that will probably drop to under 4% because of a shortage of workers entering from overseas, with particularly large employers, 
look for suitable candidates, it is hoped that they will consider the employment of people with disability. The picture I have on the screen in front of you is our CEO forum relating to the Includability Project, but also earlier this week, the Ambassador Forum, which is individuals with disability, giving their feedback on what it will take to employ more people with disability now and in the future. There are many ways to answer this question, but I thought what I would, what I would leave you with is an answer from the first Disability Discrimination Commissioner in Australia, Miss Elizabeth Hastings. Unfortunately, Elizabeth Hastings died too young, too young from breast cancer. But not long after her death, Philip Adams, the author, reflected, I realised that no one taught me more about human rights than Elizabeth. She made me realise they weren't merely an issue in Burma or Afghanistan. They were missing every time our bigotry, our buildings, or our institution placed a barrier in a disabled person's path. The future of disability policy in Australia is complicated. Disability policy considers issues that range from guardianship law and public trustees and the need for support for decision making to safeguarding relating to community visitors being able to access not just residential institutions, but also people's homes. But at its essence, it deals with people, people like me. And what I hope is that when we consider the Australian disability strategy and where to next, that each and every person listening to this presentation realises and understands a simple proposition, good disability policy, and if it's all Australians. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr Gauntlet, for your very insightful and informative presentation. Uh, I look forward myself to reading the new Australian disability strategy and working within my own organisation, the Department of the Senate, to see how we can contribute to the goals of the strategy. We'll now hear from Senator Jordan Steele-John as he reflects on the importance of the International Day of People with Disabilities to him as a parliamentarian. A Senator for Western Australia with the Australian Greens, Senator Steele-John is a strong disability rights advocate, as well as handling a number of other portfolio areas for the Australian Greens. He began his political career in 2013 and was elected to the Senate in 2017 at the age of 23 making him the youngest senator in Australia's history. Senator Steele-John. Hello everybody, Jordan Steele-John here, speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Noongar Wurjuk people uh, here in the Lower South Metropolitan uh, section of Western Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking from First Nations land, uh, pay respect to elders, a past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty over this land was never ceded. Uh, happy International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, it is wonderful to be joining uh, everybody virtually today and I want to thank everybody that took the time uh, to bring this event together. Uh, International Day is a wonderful moment for our disability community. It offers us the opportunity both to uh, celebrate uh, the work that we have done together, the successes, um, and also to speak frankly, openly, and clearly about the challenges uh, that are still before us. We are united as a community in our desire to create an accessible and inclusive community uh, for everyone. And in doing that work together, uh, we have won many victories over many decades um, to bring that reality closer. It is also the case that Decision-making spaces like the Australian Parliament at key moments uh, have had the opportunity either to join uh, with the movement uh, to create that accessible and inclusive uh, community or uh, to leave those barriers in place and sometimes to make them worse. It is a, a choice as to whether to get on board uh, with accessibility and inclusion um, for all uh, that is constantly before the Australian Parliament. 
A really good example of what that choice looks like in practice uh, was the passage of the Disability Discrimination Act in 1992, which for over two decades has served for the, as the primary piece of legislation uh, enabling disabled people to flag discrimination in law, in place and space, and to seek uh, redress. Now that legislation is a couple of years older uh, than I am, and in that span of time, uh, we've learned a lot about the realities of what ableism looks like in our community, uh, the barriers that it has created and sustained, and the remedies that are needed to bring down those barriers and to drive out that ableism. And I think it's fair to say that in reviewing those learnings, there is more that we could do uh, to strengthen laws like the Disability Discrimination Act uh, to enable them to work better uh, for disabled people. Far too many people feel, for instance, that the Disability Discrimination Act puts too much onus on the individual uh, to champion and work to uh, resolve discrimination when it is themselves that have been subject to that discrimination. There is often feedback that the legislation has written uh, doesn't have uh, teeth enough and that those teeth aren't sharp enough uh, to really get in there and challenge some of the discrimination uh, and the ableism that exists. And there are many wonderful uh, suggestions that exist in our community on how to strengthen that legislation, to make it proactive to ensure that government uh, as a representative of the community is taking on its fair share of that burden of emotional and actually physical labor that is necessary to take on board uh, and to take on a disability discrimination case as well as the financial burden that can often come. Such choices as to whether to improve our Disability Discrimination Act uh, will be choices made by this parliament. And it would be a wonderful thing to see uh, this parliament on days like International Day of Disabled People and beyond that, commit to making those changes alongside all the very many other changes uh, that are needed to bring about that inclusive and accessible uh, society. One thing that I'm reflecting on uh, with such great pride this year um, is the strength and resilience that we have demonstrated uh, as disabled people. The last couple of years have been really tough for us and tough for our families, whether it's COVID-19, um, or challenges over access in the NDIS, um, or struggling to get by on the current rates of payments like the DSP. There have been many moments where we have been tested as a community. And when it would have been fair enough for us to say, we're too tired and we can't go on. At every single opportunity, the disability community has instead thrown our arms around each other and worked together to achieve shared goals, to defend our NDIS, to make sure that we get the supports that we need uh, through COVID-19, and to advocate for changes such as the increase uh, to the DSP, uh, so that disabled people are not forced uh, to live below the poverty line. In doing that, great uh, new leaders of our movement have been uh, brought to the service and great communities of connection ha have been built across states and territories and internationally. Meaning that this year, 2021, as we reflect back upon our disability community, we see a community that is energised, vibrant and powerful in ways that we have not been before and growing in our sense of pride and identity as disabled people, proudly asserting that we are disabled, uh, that we are proud, that our voices matter, and that on days like today, those voices uh, should be heard, listened to, and actions taken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Steele-John, for sharing your perspective with us and for your inspirational words. Uh, it's been uh, great that you've been able to put that contribution together for us in the midst of a very busy sitting week. Much appreciated. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank both Senator Steele-John and Dr Gauntlet uh, for taking the time to share their experiences with us and their wisdom with our audience today. We are very privileged to have been able to deliver this lecture today on International Day of People with Disabilities.
This has been our last lecture in our 2021 lecture series. A recording of the lecture will be available shortly on our website. I would like to also thank our Auslan interpreters who have been with us for each of our lectures this year and who will uh, join us next year if they're not too tired with all the work they've been doing. Uh, thank you too to our audience for tuning into our lecture series this year from far and wide. Uh, we do hope that you can join us next year for our uh, lecture series and we also hope to be able to return to some in-person um, events next year as well, uh, as well as continuing with the live broadcast. Uh, please keep our, uh, your eye on our website for information about the 2022 program, which will be made available in the new year. And that concludes our formal proceedings for today. Thank you for joining us.